One of the most difficult things for people starting out with projections is trying to figure out where to put projection cameras. And it's difficult because there's no hard, fast rules because every shot is different, every problem is unique, and all you have are basic principles to guide where to put your projection cameras. And then after a while and a lot of trial and error, it's your experience that's going to guide you. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the different projection placement types, which are center frame, along the camera path, break from the camera path, full break from the camera path, orthographic, and environment projections. There are a lot of ways of placing your projection cameras, and I've taken all those ways and made basic projection placement type categories, which these are. So for the purpose of this course, we can try to quantify something that is uh, actually kind of an abstract idea. And as we've discussed in previous videos, that the goal of setting up your projections is to one, have enough resolution, and two, have enough coverage. The first camera projection placement type that we're gonna be talking about is this first one here, center frame. And if we take a look at this diagram, you can see that this green camera here represents the shot camera, the dotted line represents the camera path, and the red camera represents the projection camera. So the projection camera has been placed in the middle of the shot path, and the focal length or overscan has been increased. The basic idea behind setting up your projection camera in the middle of the shot camera path is that as the shot camera moves closer to the projection camera, the better the projection will look. As the shot camera moves farther away, either in the head, towards the head of the shot or towards the tail of the shot, the projection starts to break. You start to see doubling and smearing. And if it's minor enough, then you don't need to set up a second projection. That's as opposed to setting up your projection camera at the head of the shot, and then by the time the shot camera gets to the tail of the shot, the projection is really broken. If you do decide to go with this method of setting up your shot camera at the head of the shot, then at the tail end of the shot, you can set up a second projection camera that will patch all of the problems caused by the shot camera being so far away from the projection camera. And that's a totally legitimate way of approaching that. And oftentimes you will approach it that way when the head of the shot or wherever you place your projection camera is actually the hero frame of the shot. And lastly, if you've noticed that I've been saying setting up your projection camera in the middle of the shot camera path and not setting up your camera in the middle of the frame range because the middle of the frame range isn't necessarily the middle of the shot camera path. So if the dotted line is our shot camera path, there could be more frames at the head of the shot or there could be more frames at the tail of the shot and you have to eyeball and figure out where the actual center of the shot camera path is. A camera move that you will most likely want to set up your projection camera in the middle of the shot camera path is when the camera is nodal. A nodal camera move is where the camera is tilting or panning in a way that doesn't cause any parallax in the image. So we're not seeing the relative movement from object to object in the distance. The nodal point of the camera is where the lens meets the body of the camera. And as long as it's turning at that point, you're gonna have a nodal camera move. But because we're working with things in the distance, it doesn't actually have to be a true nodal camera in order for us to treat it the same way as if it were a nodal camera. One quick thing about nodal camera moves is that it doesn't matter what you're projecting on because there is no parallax. So you can see here, this could be set up for some kind of panorama nodal camera move. Well, it doesn't really matter what you project on. You could project onto this or you could project onto this and it would look exactly the same because there is no parallax. You will, like with the previous projection placement example, set your projection camera in the middle of the shot camera path. And even though it's not translating, it is rotating, like panning or tilting or doing some kind of combination of the two and you need to figure out what the middle of that is, open up your focal length, and then project to have full coverage. 
The next camera projection placement type that we're going to be talking about is probably the most common. That's where you set up your projection camera along the path of the shot camera. The huge overwhelming benefit to this method is that you can actually place a frame of the footage within your matte painting and when you paint right on your matte painting you will be able to see exactly how it's going to line up. And that's one of the reasons why matte painting stands out from other visual effects disciplines because of the type of control that you have over the shot. So what you're saying is on that particular frame, this is exactly how the shot is going to look. And if you want to make some kind of a change, you just go into Photoshop and you just paint in the change. If it were going through a CG process, then it would have to go into texturing or layout lighting and then render it and it goes through that whole process to affect any kind of change. Most of the time with this process you're going to be placing your projection camera at the hero frame or the frame that shows off the point of the shot. So if you're coming out of some trees and looking out on a valley below then your projection camera is going to be at the point where you can see most of the valley. As long as you're setting up your projection camera in a way where you can place the plate in the middle of your matte painting to use as reference, that is doing it along the shot camera path. So the previous example where we were talking about setting up the projection camera in the middle of the shot camera path, that is a variation of what we're talking about here. There are times when the shot camera is placed in such a difficult position that setting up a projection camera along its path is just not practical. So in those cases, you can set up your projection camera so that it breaks from the camera path. And in this case that we're talking about here, we have our shot camera and our projection camera. So this projection camera has been slightly altered from the shot camera. If that is just simply a tilt or a pan or an actual translate, you're still getting what the actual shot camera would be looking at. You do lose the benefit of being able to place your plate right in your matte painting and have things exactly line up. But you do get the benefit of not having to set up so many projection cameras. So really at the root of why you would do this is to minimize the number of projection cameras that you set up. A variation on that is to have a full break from the camera path where the projection camera isn't even close to where the shot camera is. The benefit to this is that you can get really nice coverage on everything. The drawback is that you don't really know what the shot looks like until you render it out through the shot camera. And because your shot camera is so far away from your projection camera, most likely you're going to have to have other projections to fix the doubling and smearing created from the camera that you've broken completely from the shot camera path. For these kinds of projection cameras, there is no overscan. Overscan is a function of basing it off of the shot camera. And if you're not basing it off the shot camera, then technically there is no overscan. You are just projecting through a camera. An extreme variation of this is where you have a full break of the camera projection, but it's so far away from the camera and the focal length is so tight in on what you're looking at that it becomes near orthographic. So this has the benefit of being able to project onto a lot of surfaces but then it becomes more like a texturing task. The last camera projection placement type that we're going to be talking about is that of environment projections. Unlike the other camera projection placement types, environment projections are not created for one particular camera, but are meant to build out a whole environment and work with a bunch of different shot cameras. So if you have, let's say, six shot cameras in your scene, you can base the environment projections from the placement of those shot cameras. Or you can create the environment by using a pack of cameras. So here in the center of this image, you can see four cameras projecting onto this dome. 
So this is what you'd call a four pack. A six pack would have something pointed at the top of this dome and something pointed at the bottom. And the intent of this is to project one big seamless environment. If you're basing your environment projections around all of the shot cameras in a sequence, then the intention there is to have one environment and it's going to work for all the cameras. If you're going to be using a, an environment based on like a six pack or a four pack, then most likely what you're going to need to do for each particular shot is set up its own projection camera and do cleanup or add additional matte painting elements to the shot. We can't really talk about how to set up your shots or placing your projection cameras without talking about how to keep your shots manageable. Projection shots can get really crazy complicated very quickly. So you have to make sure that you are actively on top of trying to make your shots very, very simple and clean and easy to manage. Now there's three ways that we're gonna talk about on how to keep your shots manageable. And the first one is that when you create your projection cameras and you open up the focal length or you increase the overscan, you create distortion in the image. And the more distortion that you have, the more difficult it is to work on that image. So to keep your shot manageable, you wanna make sure that you have the least amount of distortion as possible. Another way in keeping your shots manageable is to make sure that you have the least number of projections as you possibly can. So this can take some skill and some art in figuring out where to place your projection camera so that it has the biggest impact and you don't have to keep adding more and more projections. So if you have a shot that has two projections and you can make it with just one, then you've drastically cut down the complexity of that shot. The last thing that we're gonna talk about in keeping your shots manageable is to make sure that when you're setting up your projections that you are doing it at an appropriate resolution or trying to keep your resolution down as low as possible. The last way that we're gonna talk about for keeping your shots manageable is to make sure that you have an appropriate resolution for your projection camera. So you do not want really crazy high resolution for your projections because it just slows everything down. So the load times, your nuke scripts, it just makes the whole process very, very bogged down. There are times though where you need to drastically increase one of these areas. So if you need to increase the number of your projections, then most likely it's because you have a difficult camera movement or that you have a large camera movement. So if you have this big flying magic carpet ride kind of camera move, then there's not really any way to get around covering that shot unless you do a lot of projections. The primary reason for increasing the distortion by opening the focal length or increasing the overscan size is to limit the number of projection cameras. So if you've got a couple of projection cameras and if you increase the distortion of one of those cameras and you can get rid of the other camera, then that might be sufficient enough to warrant this kind of increased distortion. And the same could be said for resolution. If you increase the resolution of your projection, especially when you're working with nested projections, you will be able to limit the number of projection cameras. And if you manage your resources, then maybe you can say, I can deal with these really heavy resolution files because it limits so many projections that it makes it worth it. So when you're working on shots, it's a bit of a balancing act where you will be making compromises in one area so that you can save time and resources in another area. This is all dependent on the needs of the shot. And so that's what makes setting up these projections very difficult because you have these three areas and you're kind of trying to juggle them all at the same time. What you don't want to do is be making compromises in all of these areas at once because that makes your shot very hard and very expensive. In this video, we've been talking about how to set up your shots and where to place your projection cameras. So to make you more comfortable with how to do this process, 
we have a whole section here that's dedicated to doing just that. So let's get started and move forward in the course.